Hi, I'm Mimi Gerges. After Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. military realized it needed some serious code-breaking help. And it was young, college-educated women that filled that need. It made them the best possible code breakers and also intelligence agents because people just assumed that whatever they were doing, it couldn't be important and it was probably pretty boring. Welcome to the Mimi Gerges Show. During World War II, when the men were sent overseas, women rushed into the workforce to help the war effort. You've probably heard of Rosie the Riveter, but there was also Rosie the Codebreaker. Thousands of American women came to Washington to decipher enemy communications and to give the U.S. military the intelligence they needed on the battlefield. Their work was so highly classified, their contributions were nearly forgotten to history. Best-selling author Liza Mundy tells their story in a book called Code Girls. Liza, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. This entire military code-breaking program was so classified. How did you find out about it? I was reading some recently declassified material that was specifically about the Venona code-breaking project, which was our tiny but very top-secret effort to break Russian codes during the war. And of course, they were our ally, and we weren't really supposed to be reading their messages, but that kind of thing happens. And uh, it mentioned that a lot of the Venona code-breakers, both during the war and after the war, were women, and specifically were former school teachers who had been recruited from the American South at post office, at various public places, these school teachers who didn't necessarily want to be teaching school applied for jobs they didn't know what they would be doing and they came to Washington and they were given a bit of training and some messages and uh, some of them spent the rest of their lives actually at the NSA. So I knew about the small Russian program. Uh, I went out to the Cryptology Museum. I was talking to historians and curators there, and they really laid out the fact that it was primarily German and Japanese messages that we were reading during the war, and that it was thousands upon thousands of women. It was more than 10,000 women who relocated from all over the country to come to Washington and break these military codes. You were racing against the clock in a certain way because most of these women have already died, right. and the ones that are left are very elderly. Right, so they're in their mid-90s. And in fact, I came to think of 92 as young because some of the women were 95 when I was interviewing them, and a couple of them are 97 now that the book is being published. And uh, very, very happy to have lived long enough to see their uh, contributions recognized. And, but you're right, I was racing against the clock, and I had rosters of women, but it was often their maiden names. So simply figuring out who was still alive, tracking them down, finding their phone numbers. In some cases, I was cold calling women who are in assisted living facilities. So it, every reporting um, experience is, has its own challenges. <laughs> the attack on Pearl Harbor was obviously very devastating. Why was the U.S. Navy so taken by surprise? Well, you know, it's hard to believe now because we have so many intelligence agencies. But in fact, in 1941, we really didn't have very many. We didn't have the CIA. We didn't have the NSA. We didn't have much in the way of military intelligence. And, but it is, I mean, that's a lasting controversy, how it is. We knew something was going to happen in the Pacific somewhere. Our whole fleet was in Pearl Harbor. So you kind of think that there might have been some anticipation. But at, at that point, we were able to read some enemy code and cipher systems. We were able to read the Japanese diplomatic cipher system that was very, very important both before and during the war, but the Japanese Navy had not told the Japanese diplomats what they were planning to do. So the diplomats didn't know and we couldn't get it from those codes. And the naval codes, the, the books changed periodically. So even though we could read the naval codes, the code books had recently changed and they had new code groups. So we were still trying to break into their new code book, basically. And really our cryptology, the, the field of cryptology wasn't really that developed at that time. Right, it, it, was, it was a very young field and that's one of the reasons that women were able to break into it and be pioneers and 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 the only reason really that we were able to read the Japanese naval fleet code prior to Pearl Harbor and, and then certainly again afterwards was the work of a woman named Agnes Driscoll who was a former school teacher from Texas who had actually joined the Navy during World War I when women were briefly allowed to join the Navy then she came back as a civilian and she really spent the 1930s breaking that naval code and if it had not been for her we would have gone into World War II with really no ability to read the Japanese Naval Code. So then once the military said, you know what, we don't want to be blind and deaf to enemy intentions right. anymore, 
Was it an obvious choice for them to say, you know, we need women? It was an incredible thing to look through the National Archives at the naval records as they were trying to figure out where they were going to get their intelligence officers and their code breakers from. Uh, even a couple of years prior to the war, they were looking for sources. They had a training program that they would secretly send out to male undergraduates at Harvard and Yale and MIT. And you can see this one memo where they write, new source, women's colleges. And that was several months before Pearl Harbor. They were already thinking, OK, we're, you know, we're going to enter the war. Every, everybody knew once Paris had fallen that we were going to enter the war at some point. And so I don't know that it was an obvious choice, but somebody had obviously suggested it and appeared in a memo. And then this incredible thing started happening. Young women at the Seven Sisters schools, Smith, Radcliffe, Wellesley, Bryn Mawr, Mount Holyoke, would get these secret letters in their mailboxes inviting them to these clandestine meetings with certain professors. Astronomy professors and math professors uh, would identify certain seniors at those schools and call them in and say, um, do you like crossword puzzles and are you engaged to be married? And the right answer to the first was, yes, I like crossword puzzles and no, I'm not engaged to be married. OK, well, let's talk about yeah. that because how do you say I need a code breaker then how do you decide, I need somebody good in math mm -hmm. or I need somebody good in languages? Both. Like, how do you do that? Both, because these are usually numerical codes. So the Japanese Navy, their word for embarking might be a five-digit code group. And then they'll add another five-digit code group to it. That's enciphering. It was an early version of encryption. And it's just a series of numbers, mm -hmm. you Series mean. of numbers. And send it over the radio waves. We would intercept it. And so a person might be looking at a whole series of numbers. And they need to perform some addition and subtraction even to strip out the encryption. But then they need language skills in order to be able to figure out where in a sentence certain words might appear. And so really, you wanted women with a great liberal arts education, where they had gotten some science, some math, and some languages. And that's why they were looking for college-educated women. And at that time, only 4% of American women had graduated from a four-year college. Which so, is amazing, yeah. I guess, from in yeah. hindsight, like only 4%. Right. right. But they didn't have a whole lot of job opportunities. Why would they go to college exactly. if there's no job? Exactly. And when I interviewed the Living Code Breakers, I always asked them, why did you go to college? What were you thinking you were going to be able to do? Because school teacher was really the only job consistently available to women who had graduated from college. And even then, once you got married, you were generally expected to quit. So these were incredibly motivated, intellectually motivated women. Although sometimes they were sent to college in order to meet men at neighboring men's schools. So it was kind of a mixture of academic rigor and intense pressure to marry, which is why some of these women were, were actually eager to say, no, I'm not engaged to be married, because they were able to get out of engagements that they really weren't interested in. That's what I was going to ask you. Mm -hmm. What's the big deal about a married woman? Why can't you have a married woman? You know, that's funny. I think because it was assumed, even though, let's say they were engaged, probably their boyfriends were going to be shipping out to sea anyway. But there was a lot of marriage and relocation. If their young husbands were in training somewhere, the women might follow them to the training camp. So I think the assumption was that the women might not be able to move down to Washington if they were getting married. They might feel that they had to relocate. But in 1942, when these women were actually allowed to join the Navy as waves, at first, they weren't even supposed to get married. Ultimately, they were allowed to get married. But there was a lot of expectation that once a woman got married, she would uh, either leave the workforce or follow her husband. So I think they, they felt like they were safer. So now, what made these women agree to this? Because first of all, it's like this is a government job. You have to leave. You have to move to Washington. And we can't really tell you what you're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. So come anyway. Right. Well, patriotism. After Pearl Harbor, you know, all the young men flooded recruiting stations. And the women wanted to serve the war effort also. Many of the women had brothers and boyfriends and fiancés who now were in the Pacific, or they were in Europe, or they were on ships escorting convoys through the Atlantic. So they knew that they had men who were at risk, who they loved, and who were in their families. And, and they literally sometimes took this job to save them. Once they knew what they were going to be doing, not only did they want to help the war effort in general, and specifically save America from fascism, uh, one woman I interviewed who was at Wellesley in the class of 43, she said so memorably, she said, the worst thing we could imagine was to be Nazis, and I couldn't let that happen.
So they were willing to do anything to keep that from happening. So, and, and, and in some cases, they were really interested by the work that they were about mm -hmm. to be able to do. So how do you train somebody to be a code breaker, right? I, I mean, how can you say, here's a code, this is how you break it? Especially, it's a, such a, a new field. Right, it was a very new field then, and the training was very new also. Aptitude tests, all the aptitude testing that we do now, a lot of it was really born and pioneered during World War II, as they were trying to figure out how do you identify people you know, who could do certain skills. One of the things that the women were taught is that letters of the alphabet have behavior patterns. And there are certain letters of the English alphabet that appear much more frequently than others. Uh, T, S, E, O. And, and so you learn to take frequency counts. If you're looking at a message that might have originally been in English, and maybe the letters have been scrambled, you take frequency accounts. And, and if, if all of a sudden you're seeing the letter Z, and it's appearing a lot, you might figure out, well, Z probably actually stands for S or T, or one of the really common letters. So they learned, you know, that certain letters often travel together, S and T often travel together. So you have to learn the behavior of language in English, but then likely you're actually breaking German or Japanese codes. And the Japanese, sometimes the Japanese codes were numerical, but sometimes they were actually Japanese words spelled out in Roman letters and then, uh, and then sent through the airwaves that way. And in which case, you might know there are going to be a lot of OOs, there are going to be a lot of OOs, and there are going to be a lot of UUs. Uh, and so it, Gosh, it's- it's so yeah. tedious. Yeah, tedious. <laughs> but they were also having to do it really fast because we were in the war. They were learning on the fly, and they were, in some cases, making it up on the fly. I mean, they were figuring out, oh, we've got duplicate messages. Let's figure out how to sort them. Let's figure out how to eliminate the duplicates and file them away and concentrate on these. I mean, and these were 22-year-old women who were innovating techniques. And remember, this was really early hacking and early cybersecurity. So when men in the tech field these days say, uh, like the Google engineer said, maybe women aren't in Silicon Valley because they're not biologically suited for coding work, uh, it's really important to remember that women actually pioneered and innovated and in some cases actually invented this field. And they were good at it. They were very because good at it. Because there were male yeah. code yeah. breakers. Not yeah. everybody shipped out. Right. So, right. I mean, they were officers, male officers. They would, they would often go out to Hawaii uh, or to places and, and do some work out there in the field. It, it is remarkable how quickly the women learned and the way in which they uh, innovated and invented techniques uh, about decrypting and cybersecurity that we're really still using. So obviously secrecy is very important in, in this type of work. And they were told that if anybody said anything, you'd be charged with treason. Uh, don't think that just because you're a woman, we're going to spare you. And if anyone asked what they did, they were told, quote, to say that they emptied trash cans and sharpened pencils. Right. And filled inkwells and give people what they need. Yes. And I mean, the sort of ironic and, and in a way tragic truth is that people readily believed them because they were women. It made them the best possible code breakers and also intelligence agents because people just assumed that whatever they were doing, it couldn't be important and it was probably pretty boring. That yeah. had to be hard on them. Yeah. Here they're yeah. doing such amazing, yeah. important work. I mean, sinking enemy ships mm -hmm. and, and saving American ships and then Oh, you know, I just sharpen pencils. Right. And I think it was hard on them. And, and sometimes relatives would try to pry them out of it. I mean, there were so many women here in Washington. There were 4,000 women at the Naval Code Breaking Facility at what is now the Department of Homeland Security. There were 7,000 women in Arlington working at a place called Arlington Hall. People in Washington started to sort of know that these were big facilities and something were going, was going on. So sometimes the women would go, you know, to have dinner with some relatives who lived nearby and they would get pumped for information. You know, women would say to me, my uncle tried and tried to get out of me what I was doing, and I thought, nope, I can't tell you. But you're right, it was hard on them. And they kept the secret for decades and decades afterward, even as their husbands were able to talk about what they had done in the war effort. The British were obviously doing code mm -hmm. breaking as well. You know, we know about Alan Turing mm -hmm. and the Enigma and things like that. Were, were the British way ahead of us in, in that field of cryptology? Uh, did we work together? Yeah. How did that work? That is a great question. They were ahead. Europe in general was ahead because in continental Europe and England, there had been reading of diplomatic messages for centuries, actually. Uh, and we were behind. We had done some work in the World War I and then had sort of allowed it to lapse. But we caught up very quickly. 
And at first, the British and the Americans were kind of suspicious of each other because the British weren't sure we could keep a secret. They weren't sure that the Americans could keep a secret. And it was very important to them as they were anticipating German movements throughout Europe and also German naval movements in, uh, in the waters around England and Europe. And they had broken the codes, thanks to Alan Turing and the many women who were working at Bletchley Park as well. And they weren't sure that we could keep that secret. But once we were in the war and we were sending convoys to England and to Europe and our men were at risk, we obviously had a stake in the Atlantic code breaking. Uh, and, and we started to work with the British. We were mutually suspicious, but certainly by the middle and end of the war, we were working seamlessly together. And in fact, one of the women who was working at the Navy facility on the, um, the Enigma codes that the Germans were using in the Atlantic, she had a British counterpart she spoke to over a secure phone line regularly. And uh, her code name was Pretty Weather, and his code name was Virgin Sturgeon. <laughs> and she never actually met him, but she told her children that, those stories later on in her life. So I wonder if Germany and Japan were using women in their war effort, because obviously their men had to go off and fight too. Right, but not, not that we know of. The German did have some women in the military, but not in these kinds of high-level positions. And that I know of, the Japanese were not using women for these high-level positions, because keep in mind, those were very traditional societies. And the Nazis in particular saw women primarily for their breeding potential, you know, for breeding the master race. And, and the Japanese also used women as sex slaves, you know, comfort women during the war. And so I think women were being used for quite different purposes. And we certainly had some sexism and discrimination in our facilities, but it really is important that we use women during the war and not just as, as placeholders for the men, not just to sort of keep things kind of running while the men were gone, but actually innovating techniques and, and having an impact on uh, sinking ships and also having an impact on on d knowing where troops were moving, where Japanese army troops were moving and German troops were moving. So there are a lot of fascinating women in this story, but I want to ask you about Genevieve yes. Rochin. Yeah. Tell us about her. Oh, she's so fascinating and wonderful. She wanted more than anything to be a college math professor. And she attended the University of Buffalo in the mid to late 1930s and was clearly brilliant. Uh, she had been the valedictorian of her high school. She had delivered the salutatorian's address. Oh, she was a salutatorian, so she gave a Latin address. And her, so she was good at math and languages. She could not find, in 1938, a university willing to hire a woman to teach math. So she did what women did at the time who really wanted a job. She took the civil service exam. She was hired by the federal government, which was more of an equal opportunity employer than a lot of American society at the time. She came to Washington and was working as a statistician in the census department, which might sound boring to you and me, but she loved it. She was a statistician in her heart and her soul. And then she took a math test in order to get just a promotion. And she was recruiting in, into this very secret, small, pre-war army code-breaking operation where they were desperately working on this Japanese diplomatic uh, cipher that was called purple that was being generated by a machine that nobody had ever seen that the Japanese diplomats in Europe were using to communicate with each other and with Tokyo. So those messages contained not only Japanese strategy, but what Hitler was saying and what Mussolini was saying and what you know they were hearing all over Europe, German weapons. Oh yeah, diplomats weapons. talk a lot. Yeah, incredibly <laughs> long, wordy, opinionated diplomatic messages. And the Americans had been working for a year and a half. The British had tried, given up. And it was Jennifer Groschen who was sitting at a table concentrating really hard on these letter patterns because the, the machine was turning these Romanized uh, versions of Japanese into, it was scrambling them into different letters. And it was scrambling them in different patterns every time it went through uh, a cycle. And she was the one who mathematically understood the behavior of these letters and was able to see the pattern that explained to them how the machine was working. And then they were able to build a replica. And we broke that diplomatic code through the whole war. We knew where the German because of her because of her, and we knew where the German fortifications were on the on the French coast, so that we could pinpoint where the D-Day landing should happen. So it was important not only before the war and during the war, but to the very end of the war. And she was just so soft-spoken and didn't like yeah. to interrupt people. Right. And even when she broke the code, right. she was like, excuse me, I think I... <laughs> yes. Like, she was waiting. Some men were talking. 
<laughs> this is very yeah. familiar, right? <laughs> Some men were talking about the machine and what it might look like and this and that. And she was just standing there. She had her worksheets because she had circled the patterns and she was waiting for a pause in the conversation to say, uh, I think I found something. And she laid it out and they, and they saw it. And then they started jumping up and, and down. And they started <laughs> jumping up and down and screaming. And one of them was like holding his hands over the head like, like a boxer. Apparently, she started to tear up a little bit because she knew how important it was. But she was already thinking about the work that they were going to need to do in order to actually, I think, build the machine. She is such an unsung hero. Were these women paid well? They were paid better than they would have been paid as school teachers. So um, Genevieve Brochin wanted Liza. to be a university math professor. She couldn't get hired. Uh, but the women who were recruited during the war who were teaching school all around the country, they were making like $900 a year. And if they came and worked for the federal government, they would be hired making around fifteen or 1600 a year. I think Genevieve Grochen, when she made that, uh, that discovery, she was not yet making 2000 a year. And she got like a $200 raise. Wow. As thanks. Were there any black women code breakers? That is a great question. There were uh, in the Army facility. So the Navy had its big facility running in northwestern D in northwest D.C. The Army had an even larger facility running in 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 Arlington, Virginia, and African American women primarily made up a separate unit at the Army facility. They were civilians, and they were working on the commercial codes used by companies uh, around the world, because companies even then, as they do now, banks and companies were finding ways to encipher their communications that they were sending out over radios and telegraphs. And those women were reading the commercial codes of companies to try and figure out if anybody was illegally doing business with Hitler, with Germany, or with Mitsubishi or Japanese companies. But so even those group of women were segregated. They from were segregated. The white women. They were segregated. Wow. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so how did the how did these women help with the D-Day invasion? Uh, in a number of ways. So we've talked about Genevieve Grochen uh, and the fact that we were able to read these diplomatic communications and figure out that helped figure out where the landing where there were the fewest German fortifications, and uh, although there were still fortifications, obviously. So that helped enormously in planning where it should happen. But it was very, very important that the Germans not figure out where it was going to happen, because they would have moved their mobile troops that were stationed all over the French coast, they would have moved them to Normandy and, and provided you know more of a defense and, and more opposition. So there was a group of women working at the Army facility who created who studied our military radio traffic and understood our patterns of our frequencies, the times that we would send certain messages, and they created a fictitious group of American troops to fool the Germans into thinking that we had troops poised to invade in the Pas de Calais region of France. So they created what they called dummy traffic, which had been used before uh, to because they, they knew the Germans were looking at our naval, at our radio signals and trying to figure out what we were going to do. So this was a ruse. It was like creating fake troops uh, to uh, have these these radio signals being sent from a place where we didn't actually have any troops. So it was it was called the first army group. It was called FUSAG, and it didn't exist. But they but it was sending very plausible radio signals uh, that that convinced the Germans that the landing was going to take place elsewhere. And it was important that that continue to happen even after the landing had happened, so the Germans wouldn't bring troops in. Um, so then we win the war. Yeah. And what happens after that? Is it like a thank you very much for your service? You can all go home and become homemakers now. Two things happen. That happens in most cases, that the women are sent home. Thank you for your service. Don't ever talk about it, OK? Don't ever tell anybody what you did. The women got secret letters thanking them for their service. A number of the women got medals that they, you know, that they kept and treasured but wouldn't show anybody. Uh, but a number of women did stay in the business. These two code-breaking operations eventually became the NSA, the National Security Agency, which is our clandestine eavesdropping and surveillance agency. It's more controversial today than it was during the war. Uh, 
But unbeknownst to most people, there were women who started during the war who made their entire careers at NSA. And one of the wartime code breakers, Ann Cara Christie, uh, who was very important in code breaking during the Cold War, uh, working on East German and, and Soviet systems, she rose to become the first female deputy director of the NSA. So there was a, an important group of women who stayed in that business. and. Um, and, and you know, and that's true of our intelligence community in general. There were women working intelligence during the war who continued working in these intelligence agencies. The ones that didn't, though, I bet it was hard for them. Very hard. First, they have to keep the secret, yep. and then all of a sudden, this amazing, you know, intellectually stimulating environment they were in and suddenly. Right. There's no cafeteria food anymore. They had their home with little babies, uh, and they're isolated from each other. Uh, many of the women had formed very profound friendships, uh, and they really missed each other. They missed the work. They missed the sense of gratification. They missed, uh, they missed their uniforms. The Navy women had gorgeous uniforms that they were very proud of, and it was very hard. And some of them, I talked to their adult children who really thought that their mothers had a form of PTSD. Uh, because some of the women also would dwell on, rather than dwelling on the lives that they had saved, which were thousands, they would think about the ones that they weren't able to save, you know, the times that they weren't able to redirect the convoy to avoid the U-boats. And they, they took that very hard because these were very perfectionist. And, you would have to you know, be to be a yeah, code breaker. Right. Liza, thanks so much. I'm so glad that these women finally get the credit they deserve. I am too, and thank you so much for having me. This has been the Mimi Gerges Show. You can see all of our programs on whut.org and YouTube. Connect with us on Facebook and Twitter and leave me your comments there. You can also subscribe to our new podcast. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join me again next time.